Prime Time Crimes presents this crime education documentary featuring two real-life crime stories and I recommend watching as if you are the victim in each story. You will be able to identify the warning signs that led up to the incident. Then consider what you would do to prevent this from happening to you or to someone in your family and leave me a comment. If we can learn from these videos, we will be educated instead of just entertained and we can move from being paranoid to being prepared. Thank you in advance for subscribing, liking and sharing this video. February 15th, 2010. It's a chilly Monday in Moxville, North Carolina, when an anxious young woman shows up at the Davie County Sheriff's Office. It appears her ex-fiance, 32-year-old Joshua Wetzler, has been missing for over six months. Stacy Carter came to my office wishing to file a missing persons report. She said she has totally lost contact with him. When I stopped hearing from him and he stopped showing up, it was not like Josh to not contact our son. Stacy explains that Josh was always a free spirit, but after months of radio silence, a missed milestone is the final straw. At first, I just made the assumption that Josh is fine. He just went off the radar. He chose to disappear. It was sporadic as to when I'd hear from him. So there was no, like, you know, rhyme or reason to when he would call or come by. And when his mom's birthday came and went and she hadn't heard from him, that sent off some alarm bells because that was not like him at all. And he always called, you know, for big things like that. And he didn't call. Josh Wetzler was born in Naples, Italy in 1977. His parents were both in the U.S. military, so they never stayed in one place for long. Josh was born about a year before we came back. My husband went to a school in California, and after he finished that schooling, we went to New Orleans. After New Orleans, we went to Chesapeake, Virginia. Josh was a good kid. He had a good personality. In high school, Josh developed a passion for music. Josh and I went to see The Grateful Dead. Several of us continued for the summer of 95 following The Grateful Dead around the country. Josh continued to follow the band as they toured, and in 1999, he met his future fiance, Stacy Carter. Josh ended up out in Washington State. I was traveling cross country, and I met some folks who told me about this great party that was happening, and that was where Josh was living at the time. And we hit it off. It was, you know, love at first sight. We definitely had chemistry. We also had so much in common. He loved horses, and we both loved music and going to concerts. Two years into dating, Stacy and Josh began a new adventure together in North Carolina. Josh and I bought 11 acres of land in Davie County. Shortly after that, he started horseshoe in school. So we had visions of operating a business out on our property. The couple got engaged, and in 2004, the family grew with the birth of their son. But a year later, with a new business and a new baby, financial troubles began to take a toll. Josh wasn't making as much money. I wasn't making a lot of money, so it was really hard to try to get our, our bills paid. Josh and I were fighting a lot, and I think that's ultimately what caused me to leave. Stacy called and told me that her and Josh had separated. I think I was more upset than she was. Despite the breakup, Josh remained a devoted father. We had shared custody of our son, and we had a schedule, and he would go back and forth and stay with us. Josh was an amazing dad. He loved his son more than anything. Josh chose to stay um, on our property, and I told him, okay, well, that's fine. You know, you can stay there as long as you pay the mortgage. Then I found out that he had stopped making the mortgage payments and that our property was going into foreclosure. I think that's when his mental health, you know, was really starting to decline or had been declining for, for some time. But in May 2008, a brush with the law would cost Josh everything. 
was arrested for having mushrooms delivered to his home through the mail. It was probably found by a dog at the post office, and so they arrested him. When the police came to his house, he had his son with him, and so then he was also charged with endangering the welfare of a child. So at that point, he was a felon, and he lost all custody of our son. He would come to my house and spend time with him there, but that was really the downward spiral for him. He didn't work very much. You know, he didn't either show up for a job or sometimes he would miss going to work for somebody and things like that. Eventually, he kind of drifted away, not just from me, but from our circle of friends. He started hanging out with other people that I didn't know. The last time we saw him was in July. We were cooking out, and Josh, he made pizzas. His sporadic visits dropped off, and by early 2010, Josh hadn't spoken to his family in several months. Finally, I said, there was something wrong because he would have called me. I just made the assumption that Josh is fine. He just went off the radar. He chose to disappear. It wasn't until I heard otherwise that it occurred to me that something could have happened. Stacy explains to authorities that what she heard is frightening. The first person to tell me what had happened to Josh was our friend who called me and just blurted out, Josh is buried in Pazuzu's backyard. And I was like, what? I had never heard of Pazuzu. I had no idea who he was. So I went to the police and reported him missing. Those were my words. You're going to think I'm crazy, but my son's father is buried in, you know, this guy's backyard. When Stacy mentioned Pazuzu to me, I was like, who and what's Pazuzu? And she said, that's his name. Investigators search social media sites and find a profile for someone who goes by Pazuzu Algarod. When I saw Pazuzu's MySpace account, the first thing I thought of drawn in my mind was the Manson family. In the photos, this guy was trying to live that lifestyle. You could tell by the graffiti on the walls, the filth, claiming to do animal sacrifices in the dark moon. He had tattoos on his face, and his teeth were sharpened. His hair was in dreads. In the photos, Pazuzu was doing satanic worshiping. He believed in bloodletting. He made general statements he wanted to be a demon, so therefore everybody should bow down to him and respect him and be fearful of him. I'd never seen anything exactly like this. Pazuzu sort of reminded me of something you'd watch on TV, a horror flick. But here it was in North Carolina. After receiving a tip about 31-year-old Pazuzu Algarod, Davie County investigators learn everything they can from social media before talking to friends of their missing person, Josh Wetzler. I have no idea what Josh's relationship to Pazuzu was. But I feel like that it was the time where Josh was feeling like an outcast. I think it kind of pushed him to the edges of society. And, you know, he was drawn to other people who were also on that edge. Every one of the friends I talked to, they all said they were scared to death of Pazuzu. He publicly announced that he was a devil worshiper. And rumors out that he killed somebody in his basement, presumably Joshua Wetzler. The biggest hurdle for me and my agency was he was supposedly killed and buried in another jurisdiction. Joshua is a resident of David County, North Carolina, but Pazuzu's in Forsyth County. I contacted Forsyth County Sheriff's Office 
and advised him of the missing persons report that I was initiating. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office is quite familiar with the name Pazuzu. Either anonymously or by name, multiple people had informed him that he had killed several people and buried them in the backyard. Due to those allegations, Forsyth County already has a profile on the alleged murderer from previous interviews with him and those who know him. When I first met him, he actually didn't seem that messed up. I mean, no more than the rest of us, just drinking, partying, and having a good time. He presented himself as this non-theistic, maybe atheist, Satanist. He had, you know, a weird kind of macabre charm. He was very good at drawing people going against the grain, the black sheep, the rejects, the outcast. Pazuzu Holgred lived with his mother. It's a residential neighborhood. Uh, he lived in a single-story brick ranch-type house. Pazuzu's house was the land of do what thou wilt. It was like never-never land. The place to go to be whoever, whatever you wanted to be. It was his kingdom, but I think it was also an opportunity to control and manipulate people. Pazuzu had a girlfriend, Amber. Apparently the girlfriend was a willing participant in the whole thing. Amber Birch grew up in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, her friends described her as a normal girl growing up. At some point she met Pazuzu and her friends described a change in her. As she got more and more involved with Pazuzu, she became almost just a female extension of Pazuzu himself. She got very heavily involved in the rituals that he did. They would drink one another's blood. Everything Baz did, Amber did. She was his queen, he was her king kind of thing, you know? From the description of Josh Wetzler's emotional state before he disappeared, it seems possible he'd been pulled into Pazuzu's orbit. Still, an alternative lifestyle isn't proof a crime has been committed. I might not agree with it, but you got a right to practice your own religion. Davy County detectives learned that Forsyth County deputies received ominous allegations about Pazuzu six months before Josh was reported missing. Serena Billings, on August 3rd, 2009, went to the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office, and she told them that a couple weeks before, her father had gone to Pazuzu's house. And then after her father, Alan Billings, came back, he told her this fantastical tale that when he went over to the house, he saw a dead body covered in a tarp. Pazuzu had told him that he had shot this person 10 times for being a snitch. And Alan had helped Pazuzu chop up the body and bury it in the backyard. Mr. Billings told his daughter he was afraid that because now he was an accessory to the crime, that he would be facing life in prison. But when deputies questioned Billings, he told a different tale. Alan Billings denies ever seeing a dead body, so there's some discrepancy there. But what he did tell them was that Pazuzu had told him that he did shoot someone 10 times, and it was buried in the backyard. The statement that Mr. Billings gave more or less gave suspicion, but not probable cause. Nothing that detectives could get a search warrant for. When questioned, Pazuzu told deputies Alan Billings' story was made up. Ultimately, authorities dropped the investigation due to lack of evidence. But now... The new allegations about Josh Wetzler's connection to Pazuzu inspire Forsyth County to check the home. On February 23rd, 2010, they return with a search warrant and cadaver dogs. 
When you roll up, pull in the driveway, it looks like a normal cookie cutter Clemens house. Immediately going into the house, the inspectors are overwhelmed by the smell. They said it stinks. Jesus Christ. It's almost hard for them to continue. There is a lot of graffiti on the walls, weird posters, weird signs. Look at that. The kitchen was probably the cleanest, most normal looking room in the house. No drain. And his mother, Cynthia's room. She only ever came out of her room to grab something from the kitchen real quick or to leave for work. The rest of the house is just crazy. Filthy, nasty, unkept, spider webs everywhere, dirt all over the floors, uh, supposedly animal carcasses laying around. Unless you've been into a death house, there's no way to mentally prepare yourself for something like this. It was like an air of evil resonating from the basement area where all of this was supposedly taking place. Despite the horrific state of the house, they find no evidence of foul play. There were four canine cadaver dogs used, but unfortunately, none of them hit. There's always factors that can play in. You know, it's not always 100%. Officers weren't able to visually cue in on any locations in the backyard where a recent burial was made or anything. After the unproductive search of Pazuzu Algarod's home, Forsyth County deputies find themselves at a dead end. As the weeks pass, it seems increasingly unlikely they will ever find Josh Wetzler. But four months into the investigation, detectives get a new lead. On June 7, 2010, Yakin County Sheriff's Office got a 911 phone call of a body found at the Yakin River Park area. It was a male subject who had been apparently shot in the head. As you go down, towards the water, that's where we found the victim lying on his back. He had $148 in his pocket. He still had his wallet. There didn't seem to be any type of defensive wounds or any evidence of a struggle at the scene. The victim is identified as 30-year-old Joseph Chandler. His mother reported him missing earlier that morning. She advised us that he was legally blind. However, he can still see enough to walk to places that he knew, as long as he didn't have to cross too much traffic. It would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for him to get there on his own. So we thought he probably met with somebody and got a ride up there. Joseph would go to a convenience store on Louisville Clemens Road to purchase beer. Other than that, there wasn't very many places that he would travel. We interviewed the clerk who did recognize him as coming in the night before and leaving with a local person known as Pazuzu Algren. With another potential victim linked to Pazuzu, detectives question him again. When he came to the door, we told him you know, who we were and you know why we were there. And we were able to go inside and speak to him. He said that there was a get-together at his house that night, that he met Joseph Chandler at the convenience store and invited him back to uh, drink some beer with them. Joseph was there for a short period of time and then left with an unknown Hispanic male named Pete. At that point, our first goal was to identify as many people as we could that were in the house the night that Joseph Chandler was there so we could conduct interviews. One of the partygoers was 20-year-old Nicholas Rizzi. 
They got Mr. Reese's cell phone number, and while doing an investigation on his cell phone number, they found that it had, in fact, pinged at the Yakin River that night near the location where the body was found. Authorities confront Rizzi about the phone records. At that point, he admitted that he and Pazuzu were there that night. He broke down and confessed. According to Rizzi, Joseph's death was an accident. They had been drinking all day, and at the end of the night, Pazuzu wanted to go shooting. They got to the park. Um, Nicholas had a 22 caliber pistol that he had described as in poor state of repair. Rizzi pulled the slide back, around ejected from the pistol, and when the slide went forward, the pistol discharged, and Joseph fell to the ground. At that point, they panicked. They didn't know what to do. Joseph wasn't breathing. They got in the car. They left the park. He threw the pistol out of the window of the vehicle and they returned back to Pazuzu's house. Rizzi's statement is enough to place both men under arrest. On October 4th, 2010, Rizzi is charged with involuntary manslaughter. I think the charges were correct at the time, with, you know, with the evidence that we had. There just wasn't enough evidence to support a murder charge at that time. Rizzi pleads guilty and is sentenced to 13 months in prison. Pazuzu claims he was too drunk to remember what happened, but he is charged as an accessory, and the court orders the 31-year-old to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Pazuzu Algarad was evaluated um, because of concerns of whether or not he was mentally incompetent to stand trial. Pazuzu's real name was John Lawson. He grew up in California. His parents moved to North Carolina at some point. They split up. His father left the family. His mother was left to raise him by herself. Mr. Algarod had a history of significant anxiety, agoraphobia, and other types of mental health concerns from a relatively early age. He only finished ninth grade and eventually dropped out. He had started following a Sumerian kind of religion that required animal sacrifice. At some point, he changed his name. Pazuzu was the name of the demon in the movie The Exorcist. I think that the beliefs in Satanism and these other religions were more a means of him gaining power over others. Pazuzu's persona, it was about shock and awe. You know, this just taking pleasure in people's averse reaction to seeing or hearing or experiencing something different and uncomfortable. After a thorough assessment, Pazuzu is deemed fit to stand trial. However, the case never makes it to court. Instead, Pazuzu enters into a plea agreement. Pazuzu Allred uh, received, I believe it was five years of probation. So at the time, the facts, the, the statements, the confession from Nicholas Rizzi, all the evidence at the scene, um, it wouldn't support a second degree murder charge. But as one case closes, another remains unsolved. I felt in my gut that Josh was buried in Pazuzu's backyard. And every day I hope maybe this will be the day I'll get that information that'll break this case. You don't give up. You never give up. Satanist Pazuzu Algarod has been put on probation for his role in one man's death but detectives still suspect he's also responsible for the disappearance of Josh Wetzler. So far, Forsyth County sheriffs have been unable to prove it, but nearly two years into the investigation, they get a surprise phone call. In November 2011, Pazuzu's mom, Cynthia, 
reported in 2009 that a boy named Tommy was over at their house and she heard a gunshot. She went down to the basement and which time she witnessed a male subject slumped over and who appeared to have been shot. But according to Cynthia James, the killer was not her son. It was Amber Birch, Pazuzu's girlfriend of three years. She said that she saw Amber with a rifle in her hand pointed at Tommy. Pazuzu told his mama to get upstairs back to her room, which she did. Investigators search police records and discover that around the same time, a local man named Tommy Welch had been reported missing by his sister-in-law, Carrie Welch. Tommy lived in Clements, North Carolina. I was engaged to his brother, Rusty Welch. On October 3rd, 2009, I had a shift at work and didn't have nobody to watch my children, so I asked Tommy and his mother if they would mind watching them. They were gonna do a movie night. When he walked his hand in the door, right? I was so excited, me and Leah was, was like, oh, God, Daddy. He got me to watch and scare movies. He always was a big fan of Halloween. When I came home, his mom was there with the children, and she was frantic. I didn't understand what was going on. She said she had sent Tommy to their apartment in Clemens, but he'd been gone longer than he should have. Tommy could leave our apartment and be at his apartment walking, probably take him about 15, 20 minutes. And she just felt something was wrong. Not wanting to alarm her children, Carrie took them to Tommy's apartment to look for him. She just basically made up stuff because we were just a little. She told us that he's possibly playing hide and seek with us, like keeping the positivity for us. When we arrived at Tommy and his mother's apartment, we knew he had been there. The door was unlocked. We could hear the music from a stereo, but Tommy wasn't there. The next day, Tommy's family filed a missing persons report, and police obtained a haunting clue. Surveillance cameras catch him at a nearby gas station, walking toward it. And at some point, he goes behind the gas station out of the camera's view. And that is the last time anyone publicly sees Tommy alive. It's like he walked off the face there. Without any direct evidence, sheriff's deputies can't obtain another search warrant for Pazuzu's home. With all the information that's coming in, you're still stuck. You know, it's like banging your head up against a wall. Nobody will go on record. Nobody wants to be involved. Your hands are tied. Three more years pass, and any leads in the murders of Josh Wetzler and Tommy Welch hit a dead end. But in 2014, one of Pazuzu's inner circle finally stands up to him. September 26, 2014, Matthew Flowers comes into the picture. Matthew was a Army veteran stationed in Fort Lewis, Washington, and had returned home from Iraq. Matt Flowers had known Pazuzu for about eight years. I partied with him. He had kept in contact with Pazuzu over the years. And Pazuzu would tell Matthew that he'd kill people. Matthew thought he was just boasting. He never thought his friend would go that far. But when he returned to the States after his deployment, Matthew found out the truth when his ex-girlfriend Dixie told him a harrowing story. Dixie told Matt that uh, she was contacted by Amber that she needed help at Pazuzu's house where Amber resided. Dixie said she went to the residence and she saw Tommy Welch deceased on the ground. He'd been shot. And Amber 
says, I got my first just like Paz does. Paz being Pazuzu. Amber and Pazuzu told Dixie, we need your help to bury him. If you say anything, you'll join him. And Dixie, rightfully so, at that point, believed the threat. Dixie told Matthew that her and Amber spent quite a long time digging the grave outside. And when they tried to put Tommy's body in the ground, well, the hole was too small. So they used the shovels to break Tommy's legs because his legs were sticking up out of the hole. Matthew tells investigators he reported the incident anonymously back in 2009, but nothing came of it. This time, he decided to go on the record, and Dixie agreed to back him up. Matthew was worried about her getting in trouble and also didn't want Pazuzu going after her. Dixie gives a 13-page statement detailing where the body was located. And luckily, Dixie had evidence to show cooperation to her statement. She had pictures. She took pictures of the body. And this provides enough information for the sheriff's office to, again, apply for a search warrant. And this time, they have actual locations for where the bodies might be buried. You know, I was ready for these answers. On October 5th, 2014, four years after the first disturbing search, Forsyth County sheriffs have enough for a warrant to search the home of Pazuzu Algarod again. When they executed the search warrant in 2014, they found the remains of two bodies. Because the bodies were interred in the ground so long, it was just skeletal remains that were left. The bodies were collected and transported to Wake Forest Medical Facility for identification purposes using DNA and also dental records. The bodies were positively identified as Tommy Wilt and Joshua Whistler. For the families of the victims, the news comes as a strange relief. It was really difficult to try to explain to my son why his dad wasn't around. He was not even three years old when Josh disappeared. But the truth was, I was euphoric. Like, I was just so happy. We finally had some closure and we, you know, were able to have a funeral for him. I had a lot of emotions going through because I was angry for one that they took a really good person out of the world. It was sad because then I had to tell the kids, how do I explain to them that bad people got a hold of their Uncle Tommy and they just killed him? How do you tell that to your kids? Pazuzu Algarod and Amber Birch are immediately arrested. Pazuzu is charged with Josh's murder. Amber is charged with Tommy's murder, and both are charged with one count of accessory after the fact. It's not something I can really wrap my head around. I didn't realize the monstrous things he was capable of. I think this is an individual who became increasingly antisocial, psychopathic in nature. Those traits were reinforced over time. I believe Amber Birch was brought into the influence or circle orb of Mr. Algarod, and she was willing to engage in whatever behaviors he encouraged her to do. Devil didn't go to Georgia, he came to North Carolina. A date is set for Pazuzu's trial, but he never makes it to court. Zuzu Algarad was found in his cell early the morning of October 28, 2015. He had committed suicide. According to the autopsy report, he used some kind of object to cut into his wrist, and he bled out. He took the cut.
coward's way out and killed himself. Let's hope he burned in hell. When Amber's day in court finally arrives, she pleads guilty to multiple charges, including second-degree murder for the death of Tommy Welch. She receives a sentence of 30 to 40 years. Amber took it upon herself on the night that they took him to shoot him and kill him because Pazuzu already took care of Josh. She wanted to be part of it. Let me do it this time. That's cold-blooded. Today, nothing remains of the den of evil Pazuzu created with Amber Birch, but the memories of their victims live on. The house was ordered to be demolished, raised to the ground. Neighbors set up lawn chairs to personally watch this nightmare finally come to an end. This whole incident was nothing more than a nightmare to them. Just the evil of the place, I mean, could never be washed out of it. Josh and I went through some really hard times, and our lives kind of diverged. But I can't help but wonder, would they have come back together again? I'll never know, and, and that hurts, you know? It's hard to, to have to live with that. We cry about it, but we don't constantly grieve about it. We gotta keep the good stuff going, not the evil. The good times is what's gonna make Tommy stay alive. New Year's Day, 2010. It's a misty day in the town of Everett, Washington. And Julie Roberts is waiting for her friend, Sherry Harlan, to meet her after work. I was going on 10 years clean and sober. And Sherry and I had made plans to go to my meeting so I could get my tenure chip. I was so happy. She was happy for me. But she didn't show up. She just didn't show up, and that wasn't like Sherry. I called, I must have called 13, 14 times and left messages, call me. And there was nothing. There was just no return, and I started getting worried about it. Julie isn't the only one who's concerned. A coworker of hers was worried because Sherry had missed several shifts. She didn't show up Saturday, and she didn't show up again on Tuesday. On Tuesday, January 5th, one of Sherry's co-workers called 911. She was really worried about if something was going on uh, with Sherry. Sherry, her dog, and her car are missing. And so the police prepared to go to Sherry's apartment. The deputies that were working, they went to the location and they were able to get in touch with a maintenance man who had a key to the apartment. And they went into the apartment, which is normal. They do a welfare check. You know, they're looking for her. The moment officers step inside, they know something's wrong. There was an obvious odor of bleach. Someone had made some efforts to clean the interior of the apartment. But as they went in further, there were portions of both tile from the flooring and carpet that had been cut out. And then in the, in the back bedroom, on all four walls, there was blood spatter. So it was pretty evident that violence had occurred in the bedroom. What they don't find is Sherry and her dog. Sherry Harlan was born on January 21st, 1974, in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon. Sherry lived with her brother and mother and father outside of Hillsboro. They were there until she was a teenager. And then her parents divorced, and she moved with her mother and stepfather and brother to Washington State. A lot of her friends, they described her as sweet and very kind and caring, a little naive. I met Sherry when we went to Rose Hill Junior High. Throughout her entire life, she never walked into a room. She, like, bounced into a room. She had this abundant energy and was always smiling and trying to make other people happy. Sherry finished high school in Washington State, and then she went to the community college for a couple of years. But she wasn't really into academics. 
industry mostly pursued relationships. Most of them were not great choices, so she had somebody that she was engaged to in Oregon who had kids that were older than she was. We were 17 at that time, I think. The engagement fell apart, but Sherry kept looking for Mr. Wright. Unfortunately, her bad luck with relationships would continue into her 30s. Min really loved Sherry, <laughs> and there was never a point where she wasn't in a relationship. There was always somebody there waiting to catch her if a relationship didn't work out. I met Sherry about nine and a half months before. We just clicked. She'd just gotten back from Hawaii. She was there thinking things would work out with somebody, and it didn't, so she was kind of in a, in a low-life spot. She just wanted to get her life back. By 2009, Sherry was struggling to get by, living out of her car and looking for work. Instead, she found two more chances at love. In the spring of 2009, she met Ari Christensen. They were both doing some online dating and going to some dating sites, and they must have liked what they heard from the other in a conversation or a first meeting because they got together fairly quickly. Sherry is always positive. So she came in, and she, like any other relationship, she's excited about it. And at the time, she wasn't working. She was just kind of involved in the relationship. Sherry had only been dating Eric for a few months when another man came into her life. She'd met a man named Dan Young, who was going through a divorce. He had a motorcycle, and he and Sherry enjoyed taking off on that and doing some trips, and she was having a really good time. He was a general contractor, and he was working on a project locally, and that he and Sherry had met on some sort of dating platform. He had money, and he wasn't shy about spending it on Sherry. He was a little bit older than her. He knew that she was seeing Eric, so he was aware of Eric. He bought her a laptop. And eventually, he helped with the down payment on a new apartment so she could have a new start again. We'd had a lot of talks about him. I hadn't met him yet. He helped get the furniture for um, things that she couldn't get right away, and she was so happy. Sherry's new romantic prospects weren't the only changes in her life. That fall, while dating both men, she also landed a job at a department store. Sherry really liked her job at JCPenney. She loved the customers, she loved the friends she made, and she was very well liked. With a steady income, Sherry adopted a dog she named Roscoe. Just a little, a little mutt, just a, a mangy mutt. <laughs> that was a box of rocks, but she loved that dog. 2010 was shaping up to be the best year of Sherry's life, which is why her friends and co-workers have grown increasingly concerned when no one has seen or heard from her in four days. After finding evidence of an attack inside Sherry's apartment, officers immediately call for backup. Snohomish County detectives quickly respond to the scene. When we did the walkthrough, there was blood visible on a, a master bedroom. In the bedroom, on a wall, by the closet, there was blood on a glove. There was blood on a shirt. There was uh, knife marks in the mattress with tissue at the bottom. There was a lot of evidence in that bedroom that this serious assault took place. There was spatter, you know, on all four walls, up high, indicating, you know, some velocity of the various blows. And the working assumption at that point was that a knife had been used. One thing is clear. Whoever attacked Sherry tried to get rid of the evidence. One of the things inside the apartment that we found was a box of these white trash bags with red ties on them. And there was some blood on the box. You see this kind of evidence, a reeking of bleach. We know bleach is used uh, to clean and to cover, uh, and sometimes destroy DNA. But one important clue survived the cleaning. There was a bloody footprint 
actually found on a t-shirt inside of the apartment. It was in detail enough that if they ever found a, a shoe that they thought might have made it, they would be able to compare the tread on the shoe to the, the bloody shoe print. Upon looking at the apartment and what we were finding in there, I didn't have a good feeling about it at all. I felt like she was either assaulted and hurt or that she was a homicide victim. Police in Everett, Washington, are investigating the disappearance of 35-year-old Sherry Harlan. From the evidence in her apartment, it appears she was the victim of a violent attack. When somebody has taken the time to tear up the flooring, that's very concerning which means that we need to start doing the victimology on the person who's missing. Who are the people closest to her? Sherry's neighbors tell detectives she was usually quiet and kept to herself. The only time they saw her was when she was walking her dog. But several days ago, there was a disturbance. One of them reported that the Saturday prior, she had heard arguing. A male voice using expletives, shut up, things being thrown around and what she believed was coming from Sherry's apartment. A few minutes later, the witness saw a strange man lurking near Sherry's car. It was parked by the dumpsters, the trunk was ajar, her dog was tied to the inside on the driver's side and she saw a male crouching down in front of the vehicle. This neighbor saw him in the front of the car, dry heaving, and then he sneezed and I'm thinking, what causes a person to dry heat? I'm thinking, well, we have an apartment where heavy bleach smell, floors are torn up, all these things are kind of adding up, and, you know, my concern was, had he killed her and dismembered her? Because that can be a very gruesome process. Investigators prioritize identifying the suspicious male and finding Sherry's missing car. To find out more, they ask the building manager for Sherry's apartment records. While the police are looking at the crime scene and looking for Sherry, uh, they learned from the manager of the apartment house that Dad Young had helped Sherry with the down payment. So he's also somebody they need to check into. Sherry's friends and co-workers confirm that Dan is one of her boyfriends. She loved him so much, but he was married, and he was leaving her and was going to be with Sherry, but she was worried about the husband-wife thing and when he was going to leave his wife. To seasoned detectives, it's an immediate red flag. Sherry seemed convinced Dan loved her, but could he have been having second thoughts about leaving his wife and looking for a way out? We discovered some text messages on her cell phone that coincided with the same weekend that she disappeared. She had texted Dan Young and she said, hey, I'm not feeling well. They were going back and forth and one of the last text messages that Mr. Young sent her was, LOL, this is what, you know, being with two men at the same time will do to you. Sherry's friends say Dan was probably referring to her other boyfriend, Eric Christensen. Before Sherry moved into her new apartment, she was living with Eric 30 miles away. Christensen lived out at a home out in Gold Bar, which is a very rural area in, in East County. It was small, but it was owned by the parents of a friend of, of Christensen's, and he gave it to him for nominal rent. It was fairly apparent that Sherry was seeing both Dan Young and Christensen at the same time. Both men are a few years older than Sherry, but the similarities end there. Dan acted like Sherry's benefactor, while she and Eric shared a more spiritual connection. According to Sherry's friends, they bonded over an interest in the pagan religion known as Wicca. Its practitioners sometimes refer to themselves as witches. Eric Christensen had been a fairly steady goer to the Wicca church. He had introduced Sherry to that. Some of their mutual friends were also involved in Wicca. And this was something that he had some interest in. 
when I lived in Snohomish. I was going to the Wiccan church. It was mindset community, easygoing, friendly, no hostilities. It was just a place to meet up and find other people that were interested in the same beliefs. The Wiccan church Eric and Sherry belonged to is in the neighboring town of Index, Washington, in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. I am the Most Reverend Bella Donna Laveau at the Aquarian Tabernacle Church. I replaced the archpriest who was in charge of the church at that time. The religion of Wicca is an earth-based religion. We see Mother Nature as a deity, a force. We see the different aspects of nature as spiritual. And we believe that all things are in balance. People tie Halloween to Wicca and witchcraft because it's our most sacred day. We honor our ancestors. We put an extra plate at the table. So it's evolved over the years. And Halloween and trick-or-treat and all of that kind of stuff is, is the children's side of it. You dress up like the dead and you go around and you ask for alms. That's the lore behind it. While Sherry embraced the religion's tenets of harmony and nonviolence, friends say Eric was more interested in its occult side. She was a very beloved member of the church. She was there all the time. She worked on the gardens and the property. I knew Eric for like a year. Eric was very strange, had a lot of weird ideas. Didn't like a lot of people at the church. He wanted to break off and start his own coven. He was trying to recruit people into that. He had these other ideas that are not really Wiccan that he wanted to incorporate into that coven culture. And law enforcement learned from church members many of those ideas involved rituals to control others, including Sherry. You know, witches try to live in harmony with the earth, but witchcraft draws people who want to have power over others. Just like in any kind of group, you have to figure out where the predators are, what the red flags are. There was something odd about him. He was quick to anger. He was always just right on that edge of dangerous type, and I didn't like it. He scared me. After learning about the two men Sherry Harlan was dating at the time of her disappearance, investigators take a closer look at their histories. Of the two, Eric Christensen's record and reputation draws investigators' suspicions, and police records show that isn't the only unsettling thing about him. Christensen had to register as a sex offender because he had a conviction for a statutory rape out of Oregon you know, some 15, 20 years previous. A few years later, Eric was imprisoned for another offense. An ex-girlfriend had, had broken up with him, and he had got his rifle and had attempted to sniper. And it indicated to law enforcement when they arrested him that the only reason that they were alive because his, uh, his sights were off on the rifle. There is a certain portion of the population that's not mentally ill, but is driven towards more psychopathic behavior. They don't empathize like the rest of us do. They can only see it from the perspective of, what does that mean for me? And how have I been wronged? Detectives learn Sherry met Eric not long after his release, but she didn't know about his vile past. She seemed happy with Eric at first, but within maybe six weeks, she could see what she was involved with. His whole face would change when he was angry. They found a place to live, but she was miserable. She wanted nothing more than to get the hell away from him. Sherry got her chance in November 2009. Their relationship started to get strained. And then when he was picked up in November for warrants while he was in jail, she took that opportunity to leave. She was going on with her life for that month, and Dan Young helped her get an apartment and helped her 
buying things to set up the apartment. She had gotten a job. But according to Sherry's friends, she knew Eric wouldn't let her go that easily. There's research that shows people that engage in acts of domestic violence, if they engage in one, they're much more likely to engage in multiple. I ran into her at J.C. Penney's, and she tells me that her boyfriend was in jail. I asked her what she's going to do next, and she's like, well, I have to go back to him. I'm like, okay, well, you know, there's places you can go. There's things we can do to help you. You don't have to go back. And she just very nonchalantly said, no, he'll kill me if I leave. Eric wasn't aware of Dan until he got out of jail. When he got home, he realized Sherry had left. All of her stuff was gone. And he started asking friends of hers, where is she? And one of her friends made the mistake of giving him the address of where she had moved to. Sherry's phone records show Eric was the last person to call her before she disappeared. A fact which makes police even more interested in tracking him down. They find him less than 24 hours after Sherry was reported missing. They find him at a nearby medical center where he's been treated for a wound to one hand. And they can tell he's been roughed up a bit. He has some scratches and some bruises and some cuts. I figure I'm going to just record a statement with him. It's just standing here. And that turned out to be gold. We're here at the medical clinic today because you have some injuries to your hand. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that happened. I got jumped by three Mexican gangbangers because they wanted to rob me. How did you fight three of them off? With my fists. Detectives believe there's a simpler explanation. When a person is stabbing another person, it's a bloody affair. It is a messy, slippery event. And it's very consistent to see injuries on the stabbing hand. Eric did not present himself as a sophisticated liar. We talk about in our circle, in the police circle, as somebody who's thinking a one layer deep. They have that initial lie, and if you try to go any deeper than that, there they stumble. And that's the way Eric was. When they ask about Sherry, Eric admits that he became enraged when he learned she was seeing another man. Yeah, I was mad. I was really mad at her. Why were you mad? Because of her sugar daddy. On December 18th, 2009, he went to her apartment to purify their relationship. That involved what Eric refers to as a Wiccan blood oath. Okay, and then what happened? I asked her, why are you here? She told me that she was there because she wanted to say no to Sugar Daddy. Okay, and I also asked her who she wanted. She said she wanted me. And so she put three drops of her own blood in in this mixture. Yes. And mix it all up oh, and it got burned. According to Eric, the penalty for breaking such an oath is severe. If we were in the ancient times, uh, you you get stoned, beaten, plunged, cast out, and in some cases, from what I understand, death. Two weeks after their December blood oath, on January 2nd, Eric found out Sherry was lying. He said that he ends up going through her phone and he saw that she had been texting Daniel Young. And this infuriated him. That's when I confronted her. What'd you tell her? I said, you broke your oath. She says, what do you mean? What do you mean? I grabbed the phone. You broke your oath. So what does that mean? That means that she is no good. Her blood is garbage. The ancient text ways. She didn't become a warlock. What's a warlock? That's what she became. It's a Scottish word. It means oathbreaker, traitor, enemy. Eric admits to police that they had a fight. She fell on she tripped over her bed. She told me to get out of her apartment. I'm like, fine. Okay, does she seem to be hurt or anything? Mm -hmm. So I left, slammed the door. I started walking. Where do you think she went? I have no clue. I, mean, I personally don't care. I hope Carmen gives her what she deserves. The more he shared, the, the more I believed this man's definitely involved. 
Investigators officially rule out Sherry's other boyfriend, Dan, as a suspect. But now, they still need evidence tying Eric to the crime scene. Two days after Sherry was reported missing, they take Eric into custody and conduct a search warrant at his home. When they're going through where Eric lived, they found some blue jeans that had some blood spatter on it. They found what appeared to be a bloody sock and efforts have been made to burn it. And they found a flat screen TV that matched in all measurables the flat screen that had been at Sherry's apartment. And in the house is where we recovered the shoe that matched the print on the t-shirt that we found in Sherry's home. Everything points to the fact this was a homicide that took place, but there is no body and they don't know where she is. We live in a smaller community out there and, you know, that's definitely the talk of the town. There is no question in my mind uh, what had happened. After finding incriminating evidence in Eric Christensen's home in Gold Bar, Washington, Snohomish County Police arrest him for the murder of his girlfriend, Sherry Harlan. But they still face a problem. They certainly had suspicions about what had occurred, but no body had been located yet. Later that night, on January 7, 2010, investigators catch a lucky break. Police were tipped that somebody come across an abandoned vehicle out in the middle of nowhere on a gravel road. It is indeed Sherry's Nissan Sentra. The car had been burnt out. We're always going to match it to the bin. Even if a vehicle is burnt, we can still figure out what the bin is. We realized it was her car. And in the car, we found a skull on the front seat. And there were also knives found in the vehicle front compartment as well as the vehicle trunk. And it was as if, you know, somebody posed the head and the knife in the front seat. The medical examiner came out and recovered the skull and it later was found to be Sherry's skull. There was a knife tip that they found embedded in the skull. And we were later able to determine that the knife set had come from Sherry's apartment. The case is now uh, a homicide and no longer a missing persons case. Four days after finding her skull, police get a tip about where to find the rest of Sherry's remains. On January 11th, a man named Ryan comes forward to share some information about his friend Eric with the police. There was something bothering him. And basically, Ryan couldn't live with himself. He was he was involved to a certain degree. Ryan is very, very gullible and very easily to be manipulated. Ryan would come and help around the church, and he was always there to help if you needed him. He had indicated to law enforcement that he had been part of the blood oath via telephone. Ryan tells detectives Eric used him as a witness for Sherry's blood oath. Then on January 3rd, Eric called him again. Christensen wanted Ryan to meet him at a park and ride where he supposedly locked his keys in his vehicle. So Ryan goes there and he realizes it's Sherry's vehicle. Ryan sees this rolled up carpet and rolled up vinyl. And as they were driving in the car, Eric said he had Sherry's body in the trunk. Christensen indicated that he had in fact killed Sherry and that he needed help in getting rid of the various um, portions of her body. And for two days, that's what Ryan did. He had driven to these locations around East County up off Reader Road and Eric would tell him, okay, stop here. Eric would throw something and Ryan could hear it hitting the water or hitting the ground or Eric would get a bag from the back of the trunk and would head into the woods with a shovel. So he knew exactly what was going on. Ryan agrees to show investigators where Eric dumped the body parts. We drove to all of these locations. That way we could document the exact locations via GPS, where items were and where we needed to bring cadaver dogs so that we could find them. There were 
were some parts that were never found, but her torso was found in one location just laying out in the open. I know we found a thigh and we found arms, and I believe the medical examiner did find evidence that they were cut with a knife. There's not anything that you could do that would justify you killing somebody. He was trying to say these things about Wicca that just were not true. We just don't, for the most part, believe in violence, dominating other people, making people do things they don't want to do. This is not what Wiccan practices. This leads towards the satanic end of things. An autopsy confirms police suspicions about the ritualistic attack. What the doctor was able to tell us that she had several stab wounds to her torso and a stab wound to her head. The stab wounds to her body, assuming that she'd been alive when those had occurred, could have been fatal, but he was not able to determine with certainty that those, in fact, were the cause of death. This is a really ugly, heinous, heinous crime. Eric has cut off her limbs. He's also cut out her sexual organs and uh, really decimated the body. They thought he even tried to cut out her heart, but didn't manage to do it. But it says a lot about this crime and about him and about how the rage that he must have had towards her. You have to be able to overcome a certain psychological barrier to go through the process of dismemberment. But to be able to develop a plan and then act on that plan creates a significant amount of, called emotional repression, and being able to do that. Two weeks after Sherry's disappearance, news spreads quickly about Eric's hand in her gruesome death leaving the residents of Everett desperate for justice. I caught the news and there's Sherry's picture. I said, oh my God, he did it. Oh my God, he did it. He killed Sherry. He was already in the Snohomish County Jail. And that's when I went ahead and added the murder charge. The defense in this particular case made the strategic decision to try to get this to trial as quickly as possible. We didn't have all of our forensic results in yet. We still needed to prove all of the elements of the crime. After a week-long investigation, 40-year-old Eric Christensen has been charged with the first-degree murder of Sherry Harlan. But police suspect there is another victim. I know that Sherry really loved her dog, and I did make attempts, you know, to try to locate him, but unfortunately, he was never found. After learning of Eric's actions, the Wiccan church distances itself from his twisted beliefs. The idea that you would have a blood oath is, it's just not heard of in any relationship in Wicca. Eric Christensen was an evil, demented, manipulative man that wanted to control. That's all he wanted. In May 2010, the story comes under even greater scrutiny when Eric's murder trial begins. What was presented to the jury was this is a jealous, controlling man who was losing control of his, his woman, and that when he realized that she was going to continue doing these things that he did not want her to do, he took action. We believe that um, he murdered her in her bedroom. The dismemberment, I believe, happened in the kitchen, which would follow with why he would rip up the linoleum. There were nine various portions of the body was cut into, and I think ultimately law enforcement located six of them. The prosecution's star witness is Eric's friend, Ryan. We ultimately gave him immunity if he was willing to testify truthfully at trial in regards to what Christensen had told him and how he had hated Christensen and get rid of the various body parts. I think Ryan is an incredibly important witness in this case. There is no eyewitness to the actual murder, but you have a witness to someone saying, Eric had me drive her body around and dispose of it. Faced with the evidence, 
Eric's attorneys try to explain his attack instead of arguing his innocence. The defense in this particular case was that they admitted that Christensen killed Sherry Harlan, but it wasn't premeditated. The argument was that he had come upon the text messages between Sherry and Dan Young and just lost it. Although Eric never speaks in his own defense, the jury still gets a chance to hear from him. My entire man on the street interview that was recorded was played for the jury. If we were in the ancient times, you'd get stoned, beaten, bludgeoned, cast out, and in some cases, from what I understand, yeah. When you look at the jurors and the looks on their faces, they are following, they are tracking, and they are coming up with the same responses I had to what Eric was saying. On June 18th, 2010, the jury finds Eric guilty of first-degree murder. He's sentenced to 37 and a half years in prison. What sticks out the most is that he just laughed about it. He was being led away and he just smirking and it's like he didn't even care. He was allowed to make a statement. And his statement was, I don't understand why this is such a big deal. It was an accident. He just didn't care. He didn't care what happened. People get life in prison for killing somebody more. There's no justice in 37 and a half years, but I don't know that 99 years or the death penalty would be justice either. He had zero remorse. And if you aren't sorry for what you've done, there's nothing to stop you from doing it again. In the years since Sherry's death, her friends and those who worked to solve her murder are still haunted by it. Eric always tried to paint the picture that either it was her fault, that their actions were guided by his view of the Wiccan faith. He tried to use that as a tool to control her. What he did was not Wicca. It was demonic, demented, sick, a criminal with criminal mind and criminal pain. And she suffered for it, and so did all of us. When you have homicide cases, it's not common that people go to that extreme to cut up people and discard their parts like garbage. That's what bothered me most about this case. She was just a special person that always made everybody else around her smile. Even after 13 years, I still love her. She'll always have been my bestest friend. She was just Sherry, a beautiful, beautiful woman that got caught up with a very, very bad man. And she didn't deserve this. The two tragic incidents in this video highlight the fact that you are more likely to meet your demise by someone you know. By watching my videos on prime time crimes, we can learn to recognize the warning signs leading up to the incident in each video and take the necessary action to remove ourselves from dangerous people or potentially dangerous situations. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing this video and for your continued support of my channel.